Hi there, I'm Andrew McComb and welcome to Outlier. In this week's episode, we're in beautiful Nelson, New Zealand, where I'm gonna be speaking to Craig Potton. He's New Zealand's premier landscape photographer. Craig has had the ability to turn his passion into his pension. It's not very common for a lot of photographers, so let's go and find out his secret. Craig, we're on the boulder bank here in Nelson. It's a beautiful location. It's like we're out in the wilderness. What's your favourite thing about it? Well, we actually are in the wilderness, even though we're pretty close to town. Um, this is a place that uh, I came as a kid when I was learning to surf and we discovered a surf spot out here. That's how old I am, that you know, surfing hadn't really been going in, well, in New Zealand even for very long. And this was a place that I found some good waves just up from here. But uh, even before that, I used to love collecting rocks. I was a little amateur geologist when I was a kid and uh, just getting out here. And this is a phenomenal place because it's um, all come from the bluff up there, these rocks. Longshore drift. Uh, and it's made this extraordinary boulder bank. Totally natural. It's also what amazes me about the place, the light, the different types of light. Yeah, well... Nelson, this place that we're in now, is pretty renowned for having long periods of still clear, you know, weather-wise. And um, so it has this uh, low raking light, which we've got in winter today, casting big shadows in that, um, but a very beautiful, quite sort of almost yellow light to it. And you're New Zealand's premier landscape photographer. Yeah, obviously, it's been a journey, and, and it's the one thing that really inspires me about it is that you've managed to turn it into a profession, which is a lot of people struggle with that. How did that all begin? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm one of those un, perhaps slightly unusual mixes of being an artist but also an entrepreneur. Uh, my father, and he was definitely a big influence on me in this respect, though at the time I didn't actually notice it. You know, in fact, I sort of was closer to my mum than I was to my dad. But in reflection, looking back at it, it was that he made it obvious to me about the fact that the world doesn't know you're living. You've got to get out there and make yourself make your own way in the world. So, you know, um, the, these are the days where, the early days where um, the headmaster at school, everyone was a bit tougher than they are now perhaps, and there was this notion of resilience that we have now was, was a lot more apparent in those days. You just had to get out and do it. So that was the kind of entrepreneurial side. You know, if you're gonna go to university, you have to make the money to go to university. Um, you wanna be a good photographer, you gotta make the money to make the, buy the camera to make the thing work. So you have to do jobs and you've got to work um, after school and during the weekends and that sort of thing. So that's the sort of work side of it that, that was important. And I think that has put me in good stead. Um, but the sort of artistic side, I mean, I do look to my mother. I'm an artist. Artists often have quite strong relationships to their mothers because that's sort of where creativity and warmth and love and uh, caring and, and having some empathy. Empathy is a really big thing. You know, I don't want to sound too new agey, but I do love the rocks out here. I love the ocean. I love the, the places that I'm in and wild places. So I got that empathy, I think, from mum. What was the light bulb that went on for you originally when you were young around photography? Was it the beauty? Was it the mission behind it? Was it the occupation behind it? Like, what drew you to it in the first place? Yeah, real interesting that. Um, I actually did start collecting rocks and connecting to nature before I started taking photographs. Um, and I also apparently, according to my mother, so this is a story before I was aware of it, used to crawl before I could even walk, so I was less than two years old, outside and find little creatures. I even found a mouse once, she never forgotten, that had been almost drowned but was still alive. Brought it back inside, look mum, look how beautiful this is. Uh, no darling, it goes outside, she would say. You know. Um, so I had this desire to bring things to other people and show them how beautiful they were. So it does go right back to those very early days, apparently. Mm. Um, so that was a kind of a, um, a marker that, that I just had this fascination or this connection with things wild and the wilderness and things that we didn't make, things that just stood out there before us, um, but we couldn't create, you know, it wasn't the man-made world. And so it's funny, but I never went to movies a lot as a kid. I never um, you know, even went to parties in adolescence so much. I actually went to the mountains, I went surfing, you know. Um, so 
what attracts you, what drives you towards the wilderness, to this day I don't know why I had that gene in me, but that gene was really in me. And um, that was before I realised that we are treating the wilderness so badly that we've actually got an environmental crisis on our hand. As soon as I found that out, you know, something around about the age of 12, 13, 14, that I started reading and just looking and hearing, as, as you can't avoid, that they were cutting down our forests, that we were polluting the ocean, that we were treating animals badly. Then it really started to sink in. The first photograph that I took, and I went back the other day and looked at it, was in a brownie box camera my dad gave me and it was at Auckland Zoo and it was these poor creatures. In this case it was a, a chimpanzee and there was another one of a lion in a cage. Absolutely the wrong way to treat animals. So the first film that I ever used was actually something that I'm still doing which is trying to invoke a concern about the environment. It was quite unconscious. I mean I thought it was amazing animal and it was at the zoo and I was happy but it actually predicated my whole life's work really. Mm. When you think about that image and that feeling that you that invoked in you what what was the original feeling because obviously you then showed it through the photo and the reason I asked that is for the yeah. outliers out there there's there is secrets within all of us that yep. give us the clues whether we choose to listen to them or not and obviously you felt that looking at those animals what was the feeling? I really think it was looking into their eyes. I mean, they say that about um, wildlife photography, even about people or relationships and that, if you can't look into a person's eyes and feel no threat, you know, feel that there's a connection there, then you've got to work out how to get that right, you know, with another person. So you look into the eyes, of course, of your mother when you're very, very young, and then your family, and that expands out and being able to look people in the eye in a, in a genuinely open sort of way um, is essential to your relationship. And I think with animals it was just looking into those, in this case it was a lion and it was a chimpanzee, and those eyes looked sad, really sad. They looked as though they were sort of beaten down, in the same way that people can look beaten down, a lot of people. And that kind of brings up straight away this notion that there is suffering in the world, very real suffering, it exists right through everything, through all life on the planet and um, the way we treat it, and also in itself. I actually started getting quite anxious about that suffering when I was about 12, 13, 14, and that led me, and it might sound funny to someone at that age, but I got into Buddhism, I got into Christianity, because obviously here's this God being nailed up on a cross Here's this guy that sits under a tree called the Buddha from a very happy family until he's lost all weight, until he's found some answer to suffering. So without being too philosophical or too heavy about it, um, it that was a big part of my early adolescence and my recognition and those photographs conveyed that suffering that those animals had around the way we'd treated mm. them. I mean, there were bars in front of them and those bars just weren't the physical bars, they were also the fact that we weren't engaging openly with these animals. Um, we were treating them as objects for our entertainment, mm. and we still do that. And to make some money. And to make some money. And that's, you know, I mean, I've never been against people making money, but I've been strongly against anything that increases suffering on the planet, mm. and anything that I can do to relieve some suffering, to alleviate some suffering, and it's at whole levels of your life, you know, at a very practical level of um, helping people out around you that are, you know, something's going wrong, um, to actually working on quite big causes like, mm. you know, forests being cut down or third world problems, etc. So it runs through from the personal to the political to the, to the wider world. And you went to university and studied Eastern religions. Did you find that that was your way of understanding suffering or was it for a deeper purpose again? Yeah, no, absolutely. I um, started reading Gandhi, um, you know, the great Indian mm. Prime Minister of, of the um, revolution that, that got rid of colonialism and, and, uh, in India when I was quite young, well before I went to university, so I must have been 14, 15, and uh, he talked a lot about the suffering of animals and hence he was a vegetarian and uh, he was aware of the fact that he didn't need to kill animals to survive 
um, that he could live on a diet that didn't require that. And so he could sort of eliminate an area there where I felt already uncomfortable about. I mean, when I was a very young kid, I went out hunting and shooting and fishing with my dad, mm. and it was a great outdoors experience. I loved the outdoors. But I always had an anxiety when we pulled the fish in and knocked its head against the side mm. of the boat to kill it. And I squirmed from an early age mm. doing that. Mm. So there was something in me. So how do I get to the root bottom of how do we treat creatures better, how do we treat ourselves better. Literally the word suffering is dealt with in Buddhism. The first thing you learn in Buddhism is that everything is suffering. Everything has a component around it that is not good and that by alleviating that as much as you can, you'll never get rid of suffering, but by trying to remove that which isn't necessary to existence, and a lot of it isn't necessary to existence, then you're going to feel better the world's going to be better. Sounds, uh, you know, very philosophical, but it's actually quite pragmatic, quite well, practical. Just get out and do it. Well, I also feel if you look at general Western society at the moment, there's a lot of people chasing a false god oh, yeah. uh, called commercialism and everything that comes with that. So what you're saying, just on a practical sense, is it's a lot of that stuff never fulfills people, does it? So are you saying that removing to help remove suffering is actually to stop chasing those false gods? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem today, are, you know, selfies where people take a camera and just take a photograph of themselves. Mind blowing, isn't I it? I mean, the front of the head is a wonderful thing, but it's not the end of the world or the start or the beginning or the end or the middle for that matter. We've become too self-obsessed and you can't find happiness, I believe, I'm quite sure of that actually, just introverting into yourself and with your Facebook making yourself out to be the centre of the cosmos. Um, you know, yes, looking after yourself is important, but actually the greatest joy you get in life is when you do something for someone or something or somebody or some context that is beyond you, someone else. You know, it's actually engaging with the other. So it's this, and I studied a great um, Jewish philosopher at university, Martin Buber, and he talked about relationship as being the way in which we exist, actually connecting to the person, to the world out there, to the environment, um, you know. And he even went as far as to say, you know, connecting to the rocks, to the geology, to the place that you're living in, that's where happiness is. And there's this huge study done by Harvard University on what makes people happy. Very hard thing to define and uh, work out, but they've done it over 70 years now, and they've come to the conclusion it isn't diet, it isn't how many wellness courses you do. It isn't all of those things. It's actually how well you connect to other people. That is what makes us most happy. You expand that out to how we all, well you connect to the world, not just to other people. And you've got Buddhism the way I practice it, um, which is to try to just expand that compassion, openness, connection out into everything. It doesn't mean that I don't get angry. It doesn't mean that things are wrong, that I can't correct, etc., etc. that there'll always be those problems. But I kind of feel that if I'm not just serving myself, but serving something beyond that, I'm a happier dude. You know, I feel better. Mm. I mean, I struggle, but I still feel better for doing mm. it. If I get too anxious about myself, and I think it's a big thing, people are getting very anxious these days about themselves, I don't get any further forward. I'm just as anxious the next day about myself. Mm. I've got the same neuroses, I've got the same problem. I can't get rid of it because it's all just going around in a big circle in mm. here. Walk outside, look out there now, open yourself to what's out there now, and a little bit of that anxiety just starts to dissipate. Mm. It just starts to uh, let itself go into the world. Mm. And, um, you know, I don't want to sound as though it's that easy, but that's a practice that's definitely helped me. Mm. Well, you talk about connection with others. It's going to help happiness for the entrepreneurs and young mm. outliers out there who are maybe questioning what they're doing in life, maybe the teenagers and uh, students at university, etc. How important is actually connecting with who you are? And then, yep. what and then to take that to the next level, did you study Eastern... So it's, what's interesting to me is mm. you didn't study photography. Yeah. You studied Eastern religion... But you're a photographer, so, what, yeah, so I'm just, right. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, was that a phase of life thing, or is that part of the journey thing as a way of you expressing yourself even more? How, like, 
And then how does that relate to the young outlier out there about themselves and, and them being themselves and true to their self and then being able to fully express themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a wonderful little tale in Hasidism, which again is a Jewish uh, mystical philosophy that I read a bit uh, around and, and did quite a bit of that at university, that study. And it says that, um, you know, God doesn't want you to be Moses. God wants you to be Craig Potton. In other words, we all have an individual way in which we approach the world because of the individuality of the way we've been brought up, the context, the place we're in, the parents we've had, the friends we make, etc. So being yourself is more important than emulating someone else. So, you know, as much as I've talked about being not too involved in your head, if you don't get the head sorted out, then you're no use to anyone else, <laughs> that's for sure. You know, you do have to get get that sorted out pretty quick but that sorting that out is what should drive you out there mm. rather than keep it all in here and get too anxious so yeah you do have to have a strong will um, you've got to not brook too much compromise uh, you have to compromise a bit but you've got to say well no that's where I'm going that's what I'm doing and certainly when we started friends of mine into conservation we're 17 18 years old we're getting a lot of flack, a lot of criticism uh, publicly. You need a bit of a will to stand up against that. Um, so you do need to be yourself for sure. And being yourself um, does require a certain sort of courage. Um, you know, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do that to hell with the critics, um, to hell with what everyone's saying mm. around me. So I guess I'd say to young people, um, you know, this is very obvious, but don't give up. You know, really stick at it. And uh, if it fails the first time, go again, go again, go again, go again. I go for about seven times. There's a point where you give up, you know, because it's not going to happen. But um, do not give up on that first failure. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur. He probably started in the order of 40 businesses. Probably 15, 16 of them went seriously bankrupt. Um, and he was only able to cross-subsidise and get out of them because of the success of some other ones. Most things you try won't work the way you expect them, or they won't work at all. You know, back your winners, get on to them, do them, um, acknowledge that you want to keep moving forward so you're going to try something that will quite possibly fail. And I think that's quite hard these days. Some people feel, oh, I want to be a great photographer. I'll go to do the Polytech course. You know, I've done four years of learning. Um, I've learnt how to sell myself, etc. I'll get out there and it'll start happening. Sometimes it doesn't. And just in timing, you've got to accept the time's right or the time's wrong. You know, the tide's coming in, the tide's going out on this particular idea. And I have a number of those proposals that I think are very good in my head, but the time's wrong. They're not going to work at present mm -hmm. for whatever reason, personal, relational, um, economic, etc. So people need courage they need to be patient around things like that um, and they need to acknowledge that some of the things that they want to do that they want in life are not going to come out the way they planned them there was a great quote from John Lennon life is what happens when you make another plans <laughs> in other words it's good to have plans make the plans but expect them to be modified by reality expect them to change so just a few examples, you know, when I was very young and started photography and wanted to move it towards making a living for me, because prior to that I was working as a full-time conservationist and people were giving us money to survive at that time, I decided I wanted to morph into making some money through photography. I gave away my photographs, sometimes for nothing, sometimes very cheaply, um, just to get my name established and I believed enough in them to know that they were good work. So I thought, well, these are good photographs. Um, you know, I'll get them out there. And people think, well, they have got a certain value. The only value that I've got is what they'll realise in the marketplace. Mm. And if the marketplace isn't going to take them because they don't know who you are, Craig who, you know, um, then you've got to get them out there, get them acknowledged. So you don't want to sell yourself cheaply in terms of your own heart and your soul. But entrepreneurs, people that are successful, you'll often find that in the early days they did a lot for very little value monetarily 
but for value or capital in the quality of their product. So you've probably heard this from business people and even the model of Amazon where they lost for years and years and years before they started making profits. In my photography, I didn't make a lot for the first maybe five years. Um, it wasn't till I was established, till people said, hey, Craig Potton is taking good photographs, that I could start putting my price, that I could start. Mm. And I think some people want to get to the end point quicker than, and the journey often is actually quite hard um, and you do have to not spend too much on other things. In other words, not have a big income through that period. And um, so, yeah, how do you get there? Everyone has their own way of getting there. Everyone has their own time in which they go there. So that the time now for a young photographer is different than the time 1970s, 80s, when I was a young photographer. So just on that, you talk about you've done five years or so with no real return financially, mm. but what were you learning in that five years? To me, it sounds like you're giving a lot of value, which also had value to you because you were getting value in other ways. What was that value for you in the early days? Well, in the early days, it was, um, as I said, morphing between uh, wanting to earn most of my living to do more of my work through photography. I mean, it's not the only way in which I have made money during life, um, for sure. I've made surfboards, I've made women's clothing, I've, made, I've had stores, I've had a whole lot of things that have gone on before I really got my passion going in a financial way. Mm. And, and they were ways, if you wish, to fund the beast, you know, to keep the thing going. Um, and they're an absolutely essential part of my story. Um, but, you know, why did I really want to get into photography and make that the way in which I lived, the way in which I actually um, made a living and was able to work full time at it? Um, it, it th those sorts of questions are very individual and to me they came through in part my reading and my looking at art and my talking to people whom I really admired that were doing things in the world that I thought were meaningful. I mean, that's a very broad set of values to talk around. Mm, but they were to your start, mentors, they were yeah, your motivators. To, they were. To start as a photographer, it's almost as if photography was just the, if you wish, the gift that I could uh, extend within myself. I mean, I tried to be a poet, but my poetry was lousy, mate. <laughs> Absolutely lousy, you know. It was, uh, it, but I wanted to be. And I still have a bit of a, you know, you talk about artists often is that they're frustrated musicians if they're photographers or frustrated poets, you know, and poets say, oh, I wish I could take a photograph or play an instrument. It's all about communication um, in the arts in particular, communicating through the emotive feeling, reason, rational side of your head. So it's not just all emotion and feeling, but it's definitely that they're the ones, the imagination that you're exciting because people respond more around the imagination. We've learned this a lot in the last two decades, really just the extent to which the brain is ignited by the imagination rather than by the reason. We have to be reasonable. If we're not, uh, things go very wrong. But essentially we're not reasonable primarily as creatures. We're actually creatures that are driven by imagination, by our feelings. We have to get some control over them Otherwise, we just become selfish idiots that look after ourselves and our own feelings drive us to strange places. But they're actually what drive us. And so um, art is dealing with the imagination. It's dealing with exciting people into something beyond themselves. I've looked at that around a spiritual sort of dimension, and, and it's always fascinated me that there is something much greater than my own head at play in the world. <laughs> I mean, to me that's kind of obvious, and it's to do with, I go outside in the morning, it's beautiful. Um, you know, that beauty is not because Craig Potton's walked outside, that beauty is there. Mm. It's a given. It's a, it's a fact of existence. It's an extraordinary thing, and I feel happy within it. So how do I relate to it? And Eastern philosophy and, and Middle Eastern philosophy, um, and I also read a great deal and did a degree in English literature in the modern novelists like D.H. Lawrence who said, we're right out of relationships with our body and our mind and the world. I mean, that's what that guy said a hundred years ago. Mm. Is he right? 
he's totally right. You know, so I was reading everything that D. H. Lawrence wrote. By the time I was eighteen, I think I'd I'd read every word just about that was published that I could of his, because he was just touching on something that I felt, not only instinctively I looked out there and the way we were treating the world, the way we were treating our bodies, um, and our mind connection, was all askew. It was all over the place. It wasn't working in a contemporary society, um, and he said. Lots of wonderful things that inspired me, as did Eastern philosophy. So it was those sort of underlying mental conundrums that I was dealing with that actually drove me and in, informed why I wanted to make images to put out there. Um, I mean, it sounds like I'm talking about a great deal of background rather than the images themselves, mm. but they're actually the motive. And the motives are really significant. You know, why are you doing it? And that is what drives, I think, good art. That's what makes people good at things because that, in a good way, makes them obsessive about repeating things till they get it right. You know, why would you just repeat photographing? I've photographed this horizon out here and this piece of ocean for 50 years. And people would say, well, you've nailed it pretty well, you know, 20 years ago, Craig, why do you keep going? And that's that obsession of the artist, that's the desire of the artist, there's always your next masterpiece, you know, Bob Dylan's song, When I Paint My Masterpiece. And you know he's never going to paint his masterpiece, you know, you know it's not going to come, but you know he's always going to strive for that masterpiece. And I guess um, it's the striving, the wanting to do better, to say better, to communicate, to get out there. Um, and that, if you take that out from your photography or from whatever you're doing in life and extend that out into the way that you want to treat everyone and to treat the world then you're likely to to be better off for doing that mm. I mean I don't want it felt that I'm some sort of person who's uh, you know made this great effort in, in, in a way which is a sort of a, a struggle it's actually a joy to do it rather mm. than a struggle mm. of course it's a fight at times and of course it doesn't always go right and of course there are problems etc but actually, I get most happiness when I'm you know, driving down the West Coast and I look at this forest and think, well, me and a few mates and a big public movement in New Zealand saved that forest. It's sitting there. It's a legacy. It's wonderful. It mm. won't be touched. Um, so I make a good photograph. People come into my gallery in town and uh, they see those photographs and they look at me in the eye and they just say, thank you. That feels good. I love coming in here, Craig. These are images that just give me a degree of peace and a degree of happiness. Walk out the door, and I think, good, you know, one up for Craig. Made a difference I've today. I've done something. I've done something today. Yeah. So, um, you know, just bringing that image into the world, it's already there, but making it and placing it in a way that people can engage and connect with. Mm. Um, that's that's kind of the the real motivation I think behind the photography and it's why when people say to me well why didn't you do a course on photography at Polytech and you know learn from the great teachers there and I kind of say well yes great to do those courses you learn a lot of technical information but essentially it's as important and, and I don't decry those courses they are good for people and, and perhaps I should have done one because I'm not overly technical but what really counts is that you want to do what you want to do and you work out how to do it. And the how is the technical. It is just a matter of going until you master those technical things through trial and error, through learning. I'd also say that even though I haven't had a formal education, I've been very aware that people have gone before me down exactly the road I'm going down thousands of people and from the first person drawing the first image in a cave art mm. in, you know be it Indonesia or be it in Spain or in um, France and those cave art that's 40,000 years ago artists have been making marks to try and convey something of the value of the world to others um, so I have learnt hugely my teachers have been going into art galleries and looking at photographs by the American photographer Elliot Porter by Ansel Adams looking at wonderful paintings of the landscape. Um, that's, that's, they're just teachers. I mean, they've put their work up there. I absorb it. Um, I'm grateful to them. Do you think, you talk about the, 
um, connecting to your why. Yep. And then, so I guess that's the imagination side, and then yep. the how's more the logistical side. Yep. Is the why teachable to people? If you look back on your journey, could you, if you looked at the outliers there, would yep. they, is there something you could say that helped you connect with that more? Like, or is it just getting out into nature and? Yeah, I think it's um, finding your own way through um, engagement, not just with you per se walking out into nature or whatever, but also literally not being scared to engage. And, and I mean that in a real broad sense, that um, we hold ourselves back, we're a bit anxious. Often it starts at school or when we get into early social engagement with other people, mm. you know, we just hold back a bit. Um, we're a bit worried that, um, you know, we'll let too much out about ourselves. Uh, we, we, we develop a thick skin because people criticize us and, you know, not, as much as bullying at school but people say something and it hurts us just trying to open up and um, I think that opening out is something that is not just as I say not just in the art world or not just in the you know what I'm doing but actually opening yourself out and, and of course primarily it is actually to people that you open yourself out right mm -hmm. from the very beginning and not being scared of being hurt because other people at times can be cruel and that's a fact you know you don't want to walk around that mm. they can be quite hard they can knock you back um, you know and that certainly happens at school um, and just somehow to develop some way in your resilience and yourself um, to say well you know he or she was being a bit of a prick today but that's okay <laughs> you know the sun's going to come up tomorrow mm. um, the day's going to be good um, so it's it's um, not being fearful of letting your soft or your creative or your imaginative side. It's not a cruel, hard world. It's a world that will knock you, for sure. So it's not just all, you know, soft pillows and roses. It's actually a tough world, but it's not an aggressively against you world. And a lot of people sort of develop this notion and develop a hard skin and I've got to make my own way in the world and they tighten up and I think often tightening up is the biggest mistake we know that you know pain is really just an experience of where your muscles tighten up because someone's put a drill into your mouth if you've gone to the dentist and I learned pretty early on that if I go to the dentist someone's drilling my mouth in those days we didn't have injections too much you know <laughs> we, were, we were in a tougher world if you wish if I just lay there with my mouth open and can tried to completely relax just let everything go there was a lot less pain and that kind of is a metaphor for the fact that if you don't tighten up literally you won't suffer as much mm. if you try to guard everything guard every penny guard every relationship guard everything you're always tight and on the defensive mm. and that will cause pain mm. you know it will cause pain the more that you can open out without being silly about it and relax and um, you know just accept you're going to be knocked around but hey you're going to be knocked there your head mm. will come back again mm. you know um, then less pain if things feel a bit better so um, we talk about that at outlier is pain is just a feeling you don't want to feel so if you resist feeling it it's going to continue yeah. to feel like pain and then suffering is just continuing not to want to feel pain over a period of time right but if you just yeah. allow yourself yeah. to be in the present with the feeling very quickly it disappears doesn't it and then you yeah. are able to express yourself a lot more yep and and that's definitely the case with a great deal of the way which we face the world there are other things which are worth noting which is that some pain is real for very good reasons you know and my wife died slowly of cancer when I had a, we had a 10 year old child and it took four years and we knew it was inevitable end. Mm. My best friend died recently, um, very energetic guy and he was gone within three months. And if you try to think that you're going to somehow walk around that pain, you're an idiot. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. it's absolutely real. Mm. And I still feel close to my wife that died, mm. um, you know, and that is not a, it, it's a wonderful feeling now, but it's 10 years after the event. Mm. Um, it, during those periods where things are going wrong 
I mean, the same with mountain climbing. You're going up the mountain, it's freezing cold, you know. The, you're on the rope, um, mm. you're waiting for the other guy to finish putting the protection in. It's just bloody painful, mm. you know. You have to go through pain mm. to get to good places. Mm. And, well, um, how would you know you exist if you only felt the positive feelings? You, if there's no light, if there's no dark with the light, how would you know it's light? Well, definitely that. Um, that's about it, yeah. Uh, it's it's an integral part of the way in which we go mm. through the world. Yeah, so maybe I've painted a picture that has been a little bit too rosy. You know, you do have to go through tough, hard mm. situations. And I think a big part of that is just being prepared to take risks, knowing that risks could, in the short term, result in more pain, not less pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the analogy there is mountain climbing. Mm. I did a lot of mountain climbing surfing in the middle of winter, putting on the wetsuit in the freezing cold when the snow's down on the mountains, etc. No one but an, you know, a very deluded person would say that was all joyful. You know, mm -hmm. It's yeah. actually not. Um, getting to the summit, catching the wave, yeah, pure joy. How did I get there? By freezing, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, sometimes uh, those, that, yeah, that yin and yang of, mm. of, of um, you know, it can be a long, strange trip getting to these good places mm. and those long strange trips that you're going through can involve um, and does involve inevitably actually often even in photography and books you publish that don't sell or you know you do a whole week somewhere and the camera didn't work properly or whatever um, you've, got, you've got to have a deal with that um, mm. and it is going to happen mm. Mm. so you talk about the long strange journey you were studying eastern religion at university what happened after that? Well, during that, not even after it, I was um, very much involved in recognising that the forests of the west coast of the South Island of, you know, the, the country that I lived in, surfed in and climbed mountains and uh, were being cut down. Uh, and uh, they were being logged to be sent at a very low value to Japan, to chip mills, which would pollute, you know, the water up there and deliver us toilet paper at a very you know, a cheap price that we all felt fine about, but we were losing this extraordinary heritage. So I got involved in protesting about that, and that became an absolutely major part of my life for several decades. I have to put it in context too, this was a period where I was also protesting about the fact that New Zealand rugby teams were playing mm. in South Africa against white-only teams. Apartheid was, uh, so we were protesting halt all racial tours. Um, East Timor was trying to split away from Indonesia. People were dying uh, in that freedom fight. We had one of those guys in our flat that had escaped. Um, so there was a great deal of social ferment and protest around issues that um, we felt at the time uh, the government were making bad decisions on that we wanted to change those decisions. So what I'm hearing is you've got a deep-rooted causality or cause um, ethos that goes within you yep. and so you've, you've obviously um, fought for a lot of causes was there a period where you just decided it's time to communicate this and you started to do that through the camera is that how it all began um, no I've been taking photographs well before then so no um, there's no sort of uh, golden moment in my life it's always been a sort of cumulative thing of that a Things that have been important to me have developed until they've reached a point where they've, you know, sort of exploded into into a major, and and certainly photography and art had um, been there from when Dad gave me the brownie box camera when I was 12 years mm. old. So that was taking the image, um, and uh, that had sort of grown. But it had, I'd been in some ways I've been sidelined by reality. The reality was what was happening with these protest movements, in other words they were cutting down the forest, yes you could drive down and you could have your eyes and the blinkers on like horses have and look straight ahead, but it was actually happening outside the window there, they were cutting down the forest when I was on my way to my surf spot in the west coast or I was on the way to go climbing a mountain, they were cutting it down there, that river was being polluted, yes I could ignore that and just live my own personal life and be happy and um, you know be a successful photographer, climber, surfer. But actually I couldn't ignore it. When I looked out there it was wrong. I had to get you know, stuck into that. So, uh, and I've often talked about it, it's kind of like a melancholy fact that you're brought up in a world that you want to do things in, but the world also is going to throw things at you that you have to face that 
you actually don't necessarily, it wasn't on your agenda, it wasn't on your list of things to do today, save the forest, Craig. It was something that was thrown at you. And it might be the same thing that your wife gets cancer, you've got to look after her, you have to stop the amount of work you are doing. You're really excited about all your work you're doing, but the priority is to look after your wife, not to do the work for that period. Time will pass, things will change, but you've got to be able to um, acknowledge that your dream has to be put to the side while you work through something else, saving the forest, dealing with the wife's illness, etc., etc. You know, because we had a child by that point in time. So whole years of my life have not had that compulsion being able to be realised through photography as much as I'd like. But I have utterly no regrets about that. All it is is just life throwing up these things at you that you didn't anticipate, you didn't want, but by hell they happened, <laughs> you know, and you had to address them. So, yeah, um, I think going into, you know, why did I just keep doing the photography? Why didn't I stay as a conservationist? You know, what was it that really which I think you're asking, you know, really drove that one through. There's a number of things in there. One is just that I genuinely believe the creative imagination, if excited in the right way, is the way in which humans will not only gain more joy for themselves, but will also treat the world and everything around it better. You know, I really believe that. So. The creative imagination is ignited through art, it's ignited through philosophy, it's ignited through the way in which we understand the world. And so it did dawn on me in a growing sort of way um, that photography was not just a way to make a living, but also something that um, you know was my kind of gift, my kind of mission, my kind of way that mm. I could speak and do things out there rather than um, other people do other ways, uh, but this was my way. This was, you know, Craig's way of getting there. You talk about your imagination and, and the journey of imagination. You must have been on some incredible journeys and obviously taken some great photos at those destinations on those journeys as well. Yeah, well, I've been incredibly lucky. and um, But, you know, people say you make your own luck. Um, I have been to all the offshore islands of New Zealand and been to Antarctica and been to the dry valleys and done a book on the dry valleys of Antarctica, which was the first book done on that area. Um, you know, so uh, I've been to some pretty extraordinary places around the world. Um, and partly those I've set up beforehand. <laughs> they weren't just serendipitous, they weren't just luck. So, was that a desire to go to those yeah, destinations? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the sort of, you know, I'll do a book on that because I want to go there, not because I want to do a book on it per se. Or well, It's a great point though, isn't it? So yeah. you're choosing what you'd love to do and you're saying, essentially, how I can work. I get to go there and how can I make it work financially? Hell of a good point. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the case. I mean, sometimes people uh, get it us about face or around the wrong way. They actually think, well, this is the mode in which I will make a living in life rather than this is what I want to do, I'll now work out how to make a living. <laughs> you know, and, and I've probably favoured the left side there, the latter side of that, you know, which is this is what I want to do, now I'll work out how to make a living through that. Mm. And it's not naive, um, it's actually what you love and believe in, you'll put most energy into, and you'll probably be best at from your point of view. And your point of view is the only point of view that is going to get the game done for you. Mm. You know, it's going to get the job done, so to speak. There's a bit of that, definitely. I mean, at the time, I fought with my dad during adolescence around philosophies of life because, um, you know, I was an alternative living. What these days we look back and describe as a hippie, um, you know, and uh, Eastern philosophy, all those things that he wasn't into. But what I now recognise that he gave me and that I picked up. So it took him to give and it took me to pick up, uh, you know, it's, it's a double way um, that that occurs, was just the ability or the desire, the um, sort of chutzpah to take risks, to say, well, that's what I really want to do. I'm going to lay everything out there that I can and make the biggest effort to do that. And um, Dad was great like that when I was a kid. Like I would show a slight interest in sailing 
So he'd buy me a bloody boat, push me out into the ocean with the sail up and say, go for it, son. Work it out. Uh, yeah, and I'd be, I'd be freaking. I'd be thinking, hell, there's a current here. The wind's coming. It's, I've just about gone over. What do I do, Dad? Keep going, boy. You're doing fine, boy. You know, he was always watching. He'd always pick up if you fell over. Um, but he definitely was very good. And he lived the life. And it's not just what you tell your kids. It's how you live that the pattern that he lived was that he took risks and um, some of those risks worked some of them did not work and um, he had to live with both you know you got to live with things and he did of being very successful in the end but he also had to live with the fact that every so often in the newspaper it said Dick Potton's business gone bankrupt mm. owes creditors you know I oh, will pay them back in three years or whatever you know try to be as moral as you can but hell, things go wrong mm. um, as much as they go right. You've just got to, and it was his sort of philosophy, you've just got to have 52% right and 48% wrong and you're a winner, you know, because it's that risk-taking that we get fearful of. And probably as we get older and we get more, other people get dependent on us. I mean, I didn't get into a full-time relationship and, and have a child until I was in my 30s. So prior to that, I did some pretty hairy climbs and mountains and we walked from Milford Sound to Nelson Lakes and things that would be much harder to put in place if, if you were in a close relationship mm. with someone else and had a child for good reasons mm. because they're dependent on you. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, sometimes you've got to, it wasn't as though I didn't want to necessarily get into those relationships, but it was a conscious effort to mm. think, well, you know, well, the body's at full flight, I want to do these things. Of those incredible destinations, which are some of your favourites? Yeah, it's good you put that in plural. I mean, if you said one spot, that's a devil's question. Um, but I definitely love the West Coast forests. Uh, and yeah, you've got to say that that is in part because of my relationship to trying to save those places. But you also got to say that there's something about those forests that um, are quite different than forests at temperate zones all around the world. And I'm not the first person to notice that. There was an amazing botanist that came here, cocaine, um, in the 1890s. And he realised that New Zealand, South Island in particular, the forest that was left down there, because most of New Zealand was covered in forest before Māori and Pākehā started clearing it and burning it, um, is subtropical. So it's kind of like you're in a tropical forest, but you're in quite a cold environment. Mm. And that's unusual. I mean, it's spooky actually and um, so it's got big lianes and creepers and it's got all that feeling as if you're in the Amazon or in the mm. Indonesian forest and I felt that right from the start these are extraordinary places this is not sort of parkland you know this is actually jungle and um, I loved it but it was very hard to photograph it and no one had photographed it very well in fact terribly uh, because it's very messy it's got all the lianes it's got all these things happening all over the place within it it's not just tall redwood trees that sit up perfectly or your gum trees in Australia or whatever. It's actually complex and, um, you know, every tree had different epiphytes growing all over it. So that kind of became problematic, if you wish, and I kind of love hard problems. <laughs> so this was the, you know, how am I going to capture this in a way that I love but also that speaks to other people? So here's a kind of a hidden beauty. People had, of course, photographed lakes of the South Island and they'd photographed mountains and the sky and the sunsets. And they're beautiful and they're wonderful and I still photograph them. But this internal forest stuff, you know, it hadn't been done well. Um, so it was kind of a um, ground zero for me to work at. So they're the places I love. So one of the photographs that I've just cherished from the beginning of my uh, getting serious about photography is Southwestern Rainforest and it's been responded to very well by a lot of people so they love that photograph too so it became a sort of one of my icons mm. um, and I guess you know I have to say that you can't do everything in any um, art form that you're involved in and as much as I loved being up in the mountains and seeing the little alpine flowers and taking the macro lens out or the alpine butterfly that existed in this incredible and difficult environment or I love the you know, coast and the oceans and everything else. I realised that if you sort of cover everything, it's too much. So my intensity and focus in photography was to hone in 
on a particular forest area, what I'd call middle ground. And it was quite specific. Now I still, so we get the message right, I still do photograph all kinds of landscapes that I love to go to and all kinds of photography. But I focus, I concentrate, I put energy into this middle ground internal New Zealand forest photography. And you do have to, I guess the word is specialise, you do have to focus quite intensely on something if you're going to get good at it. So, you know, someone like Picasso drew the same woman's head a hundred times, two hundred times, three hundred times, and then he just produced one that looked as though it was the first. It was so beautiful and so faultless and so, um, you know, without strain. But all of that beautiful faultless without strain came from a huge amount of faults, you know, strain, a huge amount of problems. He'd solved those problems. So he got to a point where it looked as though it was spontaneous and beautiful. And I'm hoping that that's where my photography is mm. with, the, with the forest. Some of the other locations, like yeah. forest is a big one? Yeah, forest is a huge one, and different forests have started to excite me. But um, yeah, definitely around lakes, around the ocean, um, that horizon line. So, you know, where are the locations? I'm a New Zealander, I'm a South Islander, I live at the top of the South Island. I have a holiday home over in, near a place called Fields. But, um, and the locations, it's not coincidental that I have the holiday home there um, of the big wild west coast ocean has become obsessional for the last 30 years of the inside fields but is a very sort of calm area because it, it's sheltered from this big 20 kilometre long sand spit um, so I'm obsessed with taking images there. I mean I don't take 10, I don't take 20, I don't take 100, I take thousands over the years of these places in an attempt to get everything out of them and to make the image that I can. They're the sort of close to home places that I focus on most. Now, um, having said that, uh, I've always loved from watching Jane Goodall on TV, <laughs> Chimpanzee, the Apes, Our Connection. So I've been in Saba and it was a wonderful trip. Um, you know, I've loved the fact that there's this big rock that sits in the middle of Australia and does nothing but glow. So I've been to Ayers Rock, you know, to Uluru. I've been there and I've taken my camera and I've gone back each day, each morning and evening again and again. Um, I've been to the dry valleys of Antarctica because I saw Elliot Porter's photographs of the dry valleys of Antarctica. I've travelled through America briefly several times because my wife came from there, from California. I had to go to the Redwoods, I had to go to Grand Canyon. I did know the work of Ansel Adams, I had to go to Yosemite, um, you know, I did know the work of um, Elliot Porter, etc. So those places have been partly driven by my excitement and desire to go there and partly driven by the, what artists had already done in those areas and I wanted to go and sort of pay a homage to just acknowledge, to see, to be in those sorts of places. I actually don't feel there's a problem if I'm standing before Niagara Falls, which I have, and there's lots of people around me. We can all find an incredible sustenance in the energy of that place. But equally, having said that, um, if I'm a in the dry valleys and there's only me and my mate in this whole valley. It creates a very different feel about how small you are in a big universe, how humans, although they are the dominant species on the planet, can't control everything. Um, and so I, I'm not an either or person. I'm a social person. I like people to love nature, obviously, um, that I wouldn't do the photography and do all the you know, uh, area around trying to encourage them to be there. But equally, I like solitude. I like spaces where mm. I'm on my own mm. um, and I'm out there on my own. And that can be achieved. I mean, if I just walk two or 300 yards this way on this boulder bank, I'm in nature. No one else is around. The odd guy walking his dog, um, you know, the odd Australian television crew up the road. But, you know, otherwise I'm on my own and I'm there. So it's a yin yang it, and they're both important. Mm. Solitude and social. Um, they're not either or, but you can't have both in the same place. 
What about which comes first, the environment when you're taking a photo or the photo? Um, like, you know what yeah. I mean? You're, like being in these incredible grandeur uh, landscapes, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that more important to you or is it capturing the fact that you were there and hey, now everyone can see it? Yeah, it's 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 driven by both actually, and um, you know, and even yesterday someone said to me, "Well, why haven't you gone to Africa? You, you know, you should you'd love Africa." Well, yes, I would love Africa. I haven't been to parts of, I haven't been to South America except just the top of it. Um, so you can't go to all the places that you'd love to go to in life. Um, you know, is that a two dollar statement? Is that a belief? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a reality you that can't. you've got 70 or 80 years um, and if you made a list of all the good places and all of that you'd seen uh, you won't get to them all mm. um, and that's fine that's absolutely fine I mean that, you'd be a megalomaniac if you thought you could do everything and achieve everything the universe doesn't only exist in your head it's far bigger and that's a good thing not a bad thing mm. uh, there are more places that you get to that's a good thing not a bad thing you're not the only person so if you establish that in your head mm. in that head space but um Sometimes it's serendipitous, so I spend a lot of time in the Himalayas. I mean, a huge amount of time. It's actually my second home, um, the Himalayas. I love Tibetan Buddhism, so that kind of drove me in that area, if you wish. But also, I have friends, and those friends climb mountains and like to wander in high alpine passes, etc. And they organise a trip, and I say, hey, yeah, I'll come with you, mate. That'd be great. What would be the most outlier destination you've been in, and for your photography? I know, like. You've yeah. been to Poland, you've been to Iceland, you've been to India, you've been to Nepal, yeah, you've been yeah. to Tibet. The most outlier, without a doubt, is um, the Dry Valleys of Antarctica. I mean, they are a place where when we got down and I went with my mate Robbie Burton, who's my publishing partner and, uh, and good mountain climbing friend, uh, we were told by the people down there that Scott Base, which is the New Zealand base, um, if we got out into the dry valleys and uh, it blew, as it does sometimes, over 120 kilometres an hour, the tent which we took would blow over. And being mountaineers, that's not something that's pleasant, but what you do is you go and dig a hole in the snow cave or get under a rock. Now the dry valleys have no ice in them and no snow. That's why they're the dry valleys. There aren't any big rocks. That is out there. That's essentially saying that uh, you're putting your life at risk mm. in, in a way that is quite scary. Um, you're 100 plus kilometres from Scott Base, so if the weather turns bad, the helicopter can't fly, mm. can't get in. So there's, there's no question that that was the most out there place that I've ever been. And we went for three weeks. We obviously helicoptered into that spot, uh, but they dropped us there with these tents <laughs> and they dropped us with the food. Um, and we spent three weeks and I managed to put together an exhibition and a book around that um, and that that was right out there. But equally, when you're in the dry valleys there's very little life that you can relate to. There's lichens and there's very simple forms of um, animal and plant life in these frozen lakes under the ice, uh, but otherwise you're pretty much there with the geology if you want to put it in that mm. language. The other out there place on the planet are the offshore islands of New Zealand. And they're out there in a sense of time, not in terms of place. They actually represent a time before humans arrived in the world. So when you go to these islands, and if you hear people that have been to them, if they give you talks about them, they'll immediately tell you straight away that these huge big albatross, these extraordinary forms of life, are not scared of you. These are animals that have no fear that you can walk right up to and put your nose right up to an albatross and have a conversation with it, and it doesn't back off in fear. And that is 40,000, it's 100,000 years in the past. Because as we developed weapons to kill every animal on the planet that we wanted to kill, they developed fear of us for good reason. Mm. On the offshore islands, they don't have that fear. So it's a time capsule of Eden, what life was like before we got violent. Wow. And it, it's an extraordinary thing because there's not just one of them, there's 40,000 in that colony, mm. there's 100,000 in that colony, penguins, albatross, um, seals, it's teeming with life. You realise how much we've lost through our own destructive abilities and you realise why you're a conservationist and you want to bring it back 
to New Zealand and I'm involved in a project where we're fencing off a headland to bring all the seabirds back onto the mainland of New Zealand to keep the predators out the fence so that they're safe with inside there. That abundance of life and the same thing with the ocean. You know, if we'd gone into the ocean 40,000 years ago, just the amount of life in the ocean would just stun us. Mm. It would absolutely mm. stun us. There would be not just the big guys like the whales and the dolphins and everything, there would be fish that would be so thick it would be like swimming through a blanket. Mm. We've got rid of all that. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't bring it back. Mm. Okay, it will never be exactly the same. Extinctions have occurred. But I'm the ultimate optimist about everything that I can be optimistic about mm. and hopeful about everything I can be hopeful about. And where we have created marine reserves and where we have fenced off areas of the mainland and brought the seabirds back, we can start to recognise, we can start to bring back. And it's a thing that's being talked about now, rewilding the world, this notion that we can rewild the world. Mm. I've got a friend that lives on the border between um, Scotland and, and England, and he's got this long-term plan. He's bringing the forest back, but he's going to bring back the otter, then he's going to bring back the fox, then he's going to bring back the bear, and then he's going to bring back the bison, the European bison. I said, when are you going to do this, Alan? He said, oh, the bear's coming back in 200 years, and the oxen in uh, 300 or something, and, and you know, the, the, um, we're going to get the bison back within 500 years, Craig. You know, and that's fantastic. Isn't that great? It's, it's, yeah, it's not a short-term focus, no, no. but it is a long-term uh, byproduct of putting things in place now. Yeah, absolutely. And, will, and will the Loch Ness monster come back? It, no, well, it doesn't exist, so it probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about the Loch Ness monster is it's evocative of Eden. It's evocative mm. of what the world was like before it went wrong. Mm. And so I laugh and smile about it. Um, there was something in that lake, clearly, clearly as there was in all through our mythologies and stories we tell our children etc mm. about these extraordinary animals that we talk to or they talk to us in strange ways in our past mm. and we've lost the language and we've lost the stories and we've lost but the echoes of those stories be they Loch Ness monsters or be they you know the wolf that um, the friends and Francis even um, you know all those sorts of things we can actually bring that relationship to nature back again. So not all is lost. Mm. We've lost something, things have gone wrong, we walked out of the Garden of Eden, but we can walk back into it. It mm. won't be exactly as it was when we walked out because of the damage we've done, but it's definitely worth walking back. we just got to act on it now, don't we? Absolutely, yep, mm. yep. And you mentioned that, uh, that, like when I look at some of your photos, I see that you know, when I, especially the forest ones, I see a little bit of Maori mythology in there. I can just feel the mm. energy of it. And it's just, I know it's just how you've captured it, but what I love about your journey, Craig, is your passion and your purpose and then your mastery of your skill have, have just been profound. But it's also only half of the journey, isn't it? There's also a part where you had to get your work out there. Yep. And how did that go for you in the early days? Yeah, well, that is the uh, how do you sell the work that you love, and and there's always a sort of a almost fear from some people around the fact that well, I really love that I can't treat it commercially, you know, and I think that's just bokum, you know. I don't believe it, not for a moment. I, I mean, I believe in trading. I believe that money's good. I believe that um, that's how we actually. <laughs> have the food on the table in the morning these days, etc. That's how we have the books we have and the society we have. So I was never um, at all anxious about the fact that I wanted to make money out of my work. I mean, I wanted to do it in a way that um, was true to the work. Mm. So I didn't want to sell my soul, if mm. you want to put it in that sort of language. And you can do both, can't you? You can, absolutely yeah. can do both. In fact, it's not so much that you can, you actually should mm. do both. You should trade in the world because that is how you will put food on the table for yourself and mm. for others. So, it's But staying true to your exactly, message and who straight. you are in the process. Yep, yep, yep. And that, and I'm going to be on a fine line here, I'm walking a bit of a tightrope, but at times that does require compromise. So you're naive if you think, this is what I'm doing, the world's got to take it as it is, otherwise I won't give it to them. Well, yeah, I mean, go and get another life, mate, because in fact, 
you've got to sometimes, and you know there's some personal relationships with people, you know, you're an untidy person, your partner's tidy, you've got to meet them halfway and put a few of your socks in the drawer. You know, you've got to do a few things like this. I had to start selling some photographs that I didn't value as much from an artistic perspective, but they were commercial. And to this day, I still do do that. Mm. So I was um, aware that to be able to get my game going, to be able to present the work that I really loved, I would have to make some compromises in the world. So I would be in the very early days working for other publishers, not for myself before I started my own company, mm. uh, allowing the fact that some of those photographs would not be printed on the best paper, they wouldn't be proof checked properly, they wouldn't come out as well as my standards demanded. But they were a necessary step on the way towards setting up my own company where I could get them to a quality that I wanted to, um, you know, the ideals that I'd set myself. I could make my own mistakes rather than other people make mistakes for me. So you do, and I want to be a bit cautious around this, but you do have to compromise. You do got to have a bit of a business plan that isn't all exactly the way you would like to present your work, mm. but sure as hell gets your work out there, gets you a name, gets you established in the marketplace. Um, all those sorts of things, absolutely essential. Again, I sort of go back to my dad. He was an entrepreneur. Um, you got to have the product, but then you got to sell the product. There's no point in putting it in a dark cupboard mm. and expecting people to come and find mm. it and open that cupboard. Yeah, the cupboard. passion doesn't sell the product, does it, it in it, the cupboard? No, not at all. It don't, you know. And um, so you have to get out there and advertise yourself. Funnily enough, the, tied in with the conservation movement. You know, people were cutting down the forest. We said it was wrong. But unless other people saw that, it wasn't a message that got out there. So we had to do things in the city, street theatre, we had to have public meetings. It's exactly the same with your photography. We actually had to, you know, you have to, if you want to get your work out there, you've got to work out ways to put it before the public so that they've got a chance, mm. a chance to, you know, they may not all work, but at least they've got a chance. Mm. But if you think, you know, oh, I'll put the work up in some obscure art gallery that no one goes to and think somehow you, you feel bad about the fact that people don't recognise you're a genius, well, you're actually not on the right road. Mm. You know, for people to realise that the work's good, they've got to see it, and they've got to see it in a place and a way in which they respond to it, not that you think that they should, per se, for a start. Mm. So I gave away photographs to aeroplane magazines, to women's magazines, to all kinds of things, just so that my caption, my name could be on them. Mm. And people would see, oh, that's a pretty cool photograph. Oh, mm. that was taken by but that. But you're going out to a larger audience too, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Taken out by that guy, you know. And, yeah. you know, a lot of my mates said, what the hell are you doing in a women's magazine? Well, I'm actually just getting my name there and I'm getting mm. the image out mm. there. And, um, you know, I'm not going to judge whether it's a good or a bad magazine necessarily. Um, you know, I've got some sort of ethics and morals, but I'm going to be fairly relaxed about these just to get it out there. Mm. So yeah, a lot of it is selling, um, and I've got no problem with selling. Mm. I, th I think it's an essential element and not something that we should see on the edge of everything. It's actually the, the way in which we do things. Well, it's almost a part and parcel, isn't it? It's a must. If you yeah, want to yeah. be a successful entrepreneur, You've got to have a passion, you've got to have a purpose, you've got to have a cause, but at the same time you've got to have a profit, don't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, you do. And um, and you've got to keep your costs less than your expenses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what and about... that's really important though, because a lot of people think, oh, I'll just go out there and I've got so many good ideas, I'm going to present them in this way and I'm not going to compromise, and that'll cost $20,000. Well, if I can't recoup that $20,000, I'm in trouble. It's called a loss, isn't it? It's called a loss. Yeah. You know, so or a learning. <laughs> well, you can say it's a learning. You can say whatever you like, but you know, where's the twenty thousand going to come from? How mm. are you going to replace the twenty thousand um, if you've taken it out of your mm. mortgage or your bank account or your education fund or whatever you've taken it out of? Um, so, yeah, you you do have to, you know reality sandwiches. You've got to mm. actually um, every so often just bite the bullet of the fact that in you've got to make a living mm. and, and that does require some degree of compromise. And to help you make more of a living, you've also got a gallery, you've done some great uh, work with uh, some of the big production companies, some movies, you've done some documentaries. Yep. yep. Tell yep. us about those. Yeah. 
Well, actually, I mean, I've done, I've been lucky, very lucky, but um, I worked for a start with my photography out there in public meetings. I didn't um, get any money for them at all. Uh, I then worked for um, government departments on national parks doing books, and I was mainly writing for them, not actually photographing, and I sneaked more and more of my photographs into them. Um, so I was also making money by, we had a retail shop that we sold product, my brother and I, that we bought in from the east, um, and I made clothing. So I had a whole, I was juggling streams of income. As I got better known for the photographs and started my own publishing company, then New Zealand's a, a market that's not big, so people were seeing it from one end of the country to the other, and that sort of jumped me into um, a sort of a public recognition that um, people like Peter Jackson, who made Lord of the Rings, the director, wanted to have these wonderful landscapes of New Zealand behind his images of Middle Earth. I mean, they weren't meant to be New Zealand, they were meant to be Middle Earth, so they were to be mucked up a little bit on the computer. But hey, let's get a landscape photographer to do those. Um, that guy, Craig Potton, I see his name everywhere. And, and that's how it got known, you know, so that's how he picked up on me. So. That was a great break. I mean, you know, it was a good break. That uh, my life would have gone on fairly similarly if I hadn't had it, but it, it allowed me to sit in helicopters and do an immense amount of photography of landscapes that um, I could sell my own images and, and that they could be twisted around on a computer and made into Middle Earth. And it was great fun too. I mean, there's something very determined about a person like me wanting to photograph on my own and do my own thing. but. Every so often, just the camaraderie of being with a big gang, mm. you know, that's mm. making a movie. There's hundreds of us, and there's 20 of my unit, and you know, we all go down to the cafe in Queenstown and have a lunch that lasts for three hours because we're sounding arty and important and mm. all that sort mm. of stuff, you know. And, and then we get out there and do it together. That sort of team game, in short bursts, I really, really enjoyed, and, and still enjoy mm. doing projects like that. Well, so, that, that Lord of the Rings led to other projects for you? Yeah, it did. It, it led, led to quite a bit of um, both location finding, but also photography for um, other movies. Um, Edmondson's movie, um, Narnia, so I worked on that. Um, and even as recently as, as the film that's, that's just been made in the South Island. Um, ah, the name's Mulan, on, is Mulan. it? Mulan. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I'm getting old, my memory banks. Um, you know, I was helping with location for that. Um, King Kong used images, and it was interesting there because we realised we didn't have to go out and continually shoot. We could go into my photo bank. So some of the images I took in Indonesia or islands were used in the back of King Kong mm. when he's sitting up on his nest with the girl and in the background of some of Craig Potton's photographs. Um, so yeah. Do they been... do they then design a set around that photo, or it's the other well, way around? It's a bit of. A bit of everything. What actually, they, and it's good old-fashioned American style, is that they do storybook paintings of, of images of the mood that they want to create mm. in, in any. And it is, I think, it's quite neat. Really, you you start a good film by trying to get a feeling, an imaginative feeling. Mm. So we're coming back to that notion of feeling mm. rather than thought, um, and you get that painted out. I mean, it's just straight out old-fashioned paintings. And then you try and match that feeling and imagery in photography. So they pull me in because I guess I have a background in not just photography, but also in art, you know, in painting. So I can kind of uh, see it way, ways in which you'll pull that feeling from one media into the next mm. media. I mean, they're closely related, but they're not the same. And um, so, yeah, they then take those images and I would often do them in tiles in the helicopter so that they could be joined together on a computer. Mm -hmm. um, and that way they're still coming towards you rather than using a wide angle which will push everything away. You want everything coming towards you. And um, if they want to, they can flip Mount Cook around the other way or mm -hmm. <laughs> so that it's back to front. Craig, an incredible, deeply rich journey of, you know, we're talking about photography but we're really talking nothing about photography. So. <laughs> When you look to the young outliers, the entrepreneurs that are out there and they're at the start of their journey and you look at the end of, well, not the end of your journey, you've got I'm a not. heap to go. <laughs> what, what, how would you sum it up for them as far as maybe helping them out a little bit on making that journey a little easier? Well, 
Yeah, I, I, I'd say straight away that if you're looking for an easy journey, uh, don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and I don't mean that in any sort of self-sacrificial way, but I do mean it's hard work. So, you know, just accept that it's hard work. But I think a lot of outliers, they know that in the first place anyway. They're prepared to work hard. It's just a matter of finding the direction and making sure that they are true to their own direction. So, yeah, the passion, the desire to really want to do something and say something and communicate something out there, find out what it is within you. You know, write down little bits in your diary. Um, go to the right movies, um, you read the right books, you know, talk to the right people, seek out mentors. They're all just sort of uh, ways in which you inspire yourself to um, just focus in on what it is that you want to do and, um, and be prepared to be influenced and modified by all of those sources that I've talked about. Because you're starting a journey, you actually don't know everything. You never will but you know even less than you will at the end of the journey. So don't pretend that there's some blueprint out there that's got your name written all over it that you've just got to live through and it's all done. And as long as I follow it through with a lot of energy, it isn't like that. The world will interact with you as you go along and you'll interact with it if you're good in terms of getting you know, your message and your way out there. So accept that, um, accept that that's gonna happen. And then just work bloody hard at getting the how you do it, you know, working with the why you're doing it. So even though I've not done a technical um, course in life through any professional institute or anything like that, every time, every day that something's gone wrong, I've made damn sure I didn't do that next time. Well, Craig, it's been a privilege. I feel like I've been sitting with the Gandalf of ah. New Zealand photography. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your passion, your purpose, and your wisdom. You're officially an outlier. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Pleasure to be one. <laughs> well, there it is, guys. I hope you enjoyed this inspiring outlier episode with Craig Potton. For more videos, resources, and information, visit outlier.tv or connect with us on our social media pages below. I'm Andrew McComb, and here's to living the outlier life outside of the comfort zone. I'll see you soon.